I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. Let's face it, if we're not innovating faster than our competition, we are going to fall behind. Creativity is the new currency. Ergo, then how do we create two things? One, the right environment, meaning the space, the room set up, the lighting, etc. And two, the exercises in the interactive activities that the two coming together create the ability for teams to be truly creative and innovative and using that flow state that generates some breakthrough ideas. That's what today's Business of Intuition interview is all about. In today's fast-paced corporate environment, as we all know, meetings are constant, and they're filled with lengthy discussions and brainstorming, but we often do not have a really well-defined way to document what was discussed in a way that's compelling and easy to remember and a way to be able to capture the salient points. We also know that note-taking doesn't always capture the kind of full meaning behind what was said. And so we miss out on a lot of things. As we know, the further away from a training or discussion that we have, the likelihood of us remembering it continues to decrease. Also, as I mentioned before, the ambiance of the meeting space can either hinder or stifle the creative juices. So therefore, we really need a new way to be able to, one, set up the meeting space itself, what does it look like, and to create different kinds of activities that really get people engaged and have them tap into that deep flow state, that subconscious ability to be creative in a way that makes it easy for people to go back to the gauge-old practice of play. My next guest is Sarah Spencer. I've known Sarah now for a couple of years. We've actually become good friends. She is a master facilitator using some very unique process that I want to share with you today in this interview. Sarah excels at simplifying complexity through her unique visualization skills, enabling her to convey organizational culture engagement as a visual story. With a diverse background as a published author, illustrator, writer, award-winning designer, creative workshop facilitator, graphic facilitator, and culture expert, Sarah offers invaluable expertise to organizations seeking to capture their culture through captivating visual representations that showcase growth and engagement. Ergo, imagining you're running a meeting and not only do you have some wonderful activities that get people engaged in some creative uh, brainstorming, but maybe you even got somebody like Sarah in the back of the room who's actually listening to what you're doing and creating a storyboard of it with beautiful pictures and graphics that later you can use to be able to onboard and to increase your learning. Sarah Spencer on the business of intuition. Well, Sarah, you know, it's uh, great to have you on the show. I wanted just to give people a little bit of background about how you and I met. Sure. I- I think it was several months ago. We both have a common client, which is Goodwill Essential in Northern Arizona. Mm-hmm. And I was facilitating a meeting. I don't know whether it's with the board of directors or whether it was the ELT, but uh, we went, I came into this meeting room and I saw this person in the back of the room with this big, huge piece of paper beginning to draw images on it. And I go, what the heck is that? And I remember going up to you and just being so fascinated by your process, being able to capture the essence of a conversation in graphical story-like means. And your work is actually phenomenal. I am just, uh, think that the way that you translate what you hear into pictures and, and storyboards is, adds a whole new level to what's going on in the room. And so Maybe I could ask you is like, what's your process? How do you get yourself to the point where you can hear what you're hearing and translate it into these pictures? I mean, it seems to operate on a different 
wavelength than what I'm used to. How do you get yourself there? What's that process like for you? <laughs> well, it's been many years of the, building the process. So at this point in my work, I'm already ready. So I can walk into a room and I don't even have to know what people are talking about. And I just listen and draw. But the process to get here has taken many years. And in fact, I have this sort of funny story. I used to hang out with a big group of gals who were really funny and fun. And I tend to be a person who is a little more quiet and listens. And I started to, and this was probably 10 years ago, I started to uh, draw what they were saying. So just naturally, mm. I started to graphic record what was being said in the room and all the funny things. And I did that for a couple of years while I was working in other fields. And I had a, we had a new friend to come into the group and she thought what I was doing was really fun. And she goes, well, you know what that's called is, don't you? And I'm like, I have no idea. I said, this is a thing. She goes, yes, that's the thing. It's called sketch noting. And uh, there was lots of books written about it. Um, I, had not, I had no idea that's what I was doing at the time. And then uh, she and I became quick friends and she was a facilitator. And then she hired me to be a graphic recorder. So uh, my process has been kind of long, but it comes from a love of listening and drawing. So in addition to you listening and then drawing what you're hearing in the room, which then creates this wonderful tapestry of visual graphical representations of what was said. And I know that you can also create books and so forth that become a, a keepsake or an archive of that event or of that piece of that culture. You also, as I know, uh, will take people through a process by which they become the drawers as well. Talk about that. Why is drawing as a way to articulate what you're thinking a useful method for learning? Well, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking. So I have discovered through my own work that drawing what I'm thinking or drawing what I want to say or even write down slows down my thought process. And what I've discovered that for myself is in the, uh, the realm of values and understanding what my values are, being able to articulate my values through visuals helps other people understand what my values are as well. So I have run workshops and classes for people um, on values and we do visual storytelling. And what that does is it really creates an atmosphere of creativity and flow. And so in the flow state, the person who's drawing or creating doesn't really have to expend energy in thinking. So the mm. flow separates the concentration from the deliberate control of attention. So what you're doing is you're concentrating, but you're not expending a lot of energy. And then what that does is that gives your mind more energy to draw from the subconscious. Perfect. So there's somebody out there that's listening to this right now who's saying, oh, that sounds really nice, but I'm not a drawer. I sucked at drawing in school. I'm not an artist. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next podcast. Talk to that person. Well, so you did draw when you were a child. And at some point, someone told you or you told yourself that you couldn't do it anymore or it wasn't valuable. And what is really valuable is that you are available. You are pop. It is possible for you to draw. Stick figures totally count. And it's the letting go of the outcome that is really what allows you to have fun in the process of drawing. So if you are in a meeting and you're doodling, that's drawing. Like no one is grading you on what you are drawing. What's happening is that your brain is communicating with your hands through the love of what you're doing in your heart. So it's really a wonderful way to connect these three pieces of your body and spirit in understanding what's going around, what's happening around you. I, I love this, you know, big fan. And the idea of being able to tap into that subconscious 
with the idea that 90% of our behavior is probably being run or influenced by our subconscious, although we don't consciously know that. <laughs> um, all Everybody talks about how do we tap into that? And you found a, a vehicle in which to do that through this process of drawing. How do you set up a team? Because this is an exposing exercise. This takes some vulnerability. One, just to sort of try something new. So we've got that. I'm not good at this. That could be a, a, a thing that's going on in one's head. And then on top of it, I want to appear good at what I've done. So I know that my little drawing, stick figure or not, might be seen by my team members. Ergo, I've got this other sort of performance pressure on top of it. How do you set the environment so that people can get out of that judgment and create that flow state and really get all the benefits of a, you know connecting to both sides of their brain. So it's really amazing what a pile of colorful markers will do. <laughs> quote so, quote. Put your bad t-shirt, Sarah. <laughs> I I'll take that. <laughs> Say more. Is that almost like we are we are seeing a portal into our childhood, and there's something familiar about that? Like, let's go yeah. back and play in the sandbox. Yeah. Yes, that's why people love to play with Legos. You know we. Although, you know, Legos are maybe a different a way to creativity and thought. But uh, what I have discovered in my work is when you use when you when I lay create creative tools in front of people. So not pens, definitely not pencils, because pencils make people nervous. Although some people do like to erase, but it's not about the erasing. It's about layering colors. It's about tapping into your child, your inner child. And letting go again of what the outcome is. So it's not about the performance. I can't tell you how many rooms I've been in with people who tell me that they can't draw, that they haven't drawn since their kids. You know, their parents told them that wasn't, you know, a thing to do or there's no value in it. And within five minutes, I have them drawing. And where that really comes from is tapping into this child that we have in all of us who really just wants to play. And what I've discovered in that is that color and using colorful things, and I, I also work with paper and scissors. I have people cut paper up. So there's a, a release from this, like what a real tree looks like or how a person is supposed to look. So simplifying what the representation of the image is to something as simple as a stick figure or as a triangle with a circle uh, pasted onto it to like, for instance, represent a human, but it's really the color that brings the, uh, the playfulness out in people. That's fascinating. That's really interesting. So I could see opportunities to facilitate a discussion with a person or a team about how they're reacting to the actual activity, not just whatever they create, you know, like say you're, you're developing something around values, mm -hmm. but our, like, what is the resistance? What is that concern tell us as we try to, to to do this new thing so do you ever sort of unpack that part of it? so the concern that always arises especially in business environments and team environments and organizations is this idea that you have to be performing at the top and what you create is the best and there's a vulnerability that the that you don't and if you're new to a team maybe you're really sensitive to vulnerability and the environment that people do this work in is as important as the work that they're doing themselves so being an open space with windows and natural light and colorful surroundings and people wearing comfortable clothes and having an environment that feels loose and free and welcoming is a really important part of the process. Could you sorry, I'm gonna pivot a little bit. So thank you for that. I'm taking I'm taking notes. I'm not drawing pictures, but sorta <laughs> on you what you're can. saying so I can come back to this. So <laughs> Oftentimes, you know, I've been in that situation all the time. You know, I, in our company, we do a lot of events and I've got a person on my team who helps manage that and God bless her. And she has a kind of a list of things that we would like to have in the, the space. And so we're really cognizant on trying to create the right space. 
how much room we have, whether people are in a U shape or, or theater style. Is there natural lighting? Is there even fluorescent tubes? You know, what kind of food are we being given? You know, all that kind of stuff. I was in a facilitation a few weeks ago and it was in a small room. Half of the room was dark. So we had to sort of huddle toward the light. It was really cramped. We couldn't get into small breakout rooms. And it, the event just didn't go as well. Now, there were other factors, but the space made a difference. So could you speak to what creates the optimal learning from a space perspective? Since in a way, you deal with space with respect to objects that you're drawing. But what about the larger macro space in which we are housing these people? What's the best kind of space to create that flow space, flow state? Flow state. Okay. Yeah. Tip of the uh, tongue, teeth, and lip. <laughs> <laughs> there are there is sort of the too big and the too small. So you have definitely expressed too small where everybody's too close. Yeah. There's not enough room to move around. And the too big actually I facilitated a uh, a team in an auditorium and so we were at the side of one auditorium. So what I ended up doing was creating a a visual barrier mm. with balloons and sort of like little fake walls to sort of block off the larger auditorium. And that also helped with the sound too. So it kind of muffled the sound a little bit and made us feel like we were in a smaller room. So being able to have a space that has enough airflow, natural light, I always have colorful things around. So everybody's always working with like markers and colorful paper. And mm. if there are any worksheets or anything they're always very colorful i also really like to include like little snacks so one one mm. kind of thing that's nice is to include something that has like some sugar in it like a little bit of glucose in it because when you are doing work that depletes your brain of glucose and so to be able to take a break and have a little bit of sugar and revive your brain to be able to dip back into the work is really helpful but the space really is about being comfortable and allowing people to move and giving people the permission to move about. Uh, like, if you need to take a break, you're welcome to go and everybody gives the permission to go. Now, hopefully you all stay together. But if something, if you have to like go to the bathroom, you're, yeah. you're not uncomfortable in that space because you can't create and you can't be in creative flow when you have things on your mind that are bothering you. Um, and if and if you're in creative flow, you want to stay, you want to stay and be in, involved and be creative. And then when you're done, you're done. And so we give a lot of a lot of a space for people to move about in not only in their physical space, but also in their mental space, too. So we always have like backup activities for people who get finished sooner or later. Mm. And then it all kind of comes around. So it's the space is super important to creating a creative flow space. So there's something you just said that I thought was interesting. Like there, there's almost, I have this, again, image of this expansion and free flowing uh, work that's being done on maybe individual or small group levels. But what I'm also hearing you say that at some point, tell me if I'm wrong, that we need to pull some of this together. We need to kind of summarize or create a, I don't know, a, a period at the end of the sentence. And that helps the person feel that there's a completion to this, not just that we created something, but that we're done with this and we're going to move on to something else. Thoughts on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so what I love to have are, I'm a very much a product person. So I like to make personally. Mm. And, and you've seen that with the books that I've done with the work. So it's, yep. it, the process is wonderful and that's good. But then also to have something at the end of it that shows that you have accomplished something is important, which which is interesting because I'm so much about the process, but then I also really love to have like a little product. So it's it, it's important in the facilitation to in, in my facilitation to have people walk work through the process, but then also have something that shows what they have accomplished. So there is some kind of takeaway, either physical takeaway or a, um, a group takeaway that then the group can come back to. And this is where my graphic recording comes in, where there are these artifacts that show like, okay, we've done all this work and we were lost in the process. It was really fabulous. 
And then the outcome is this. Now, it can be messy. And I allow for a lot of messy outcomes because there's always opportunity to clean it up. And the cleaning it up is really like, what's the next conversation? Like, how is this going to affect the next conversation? So it's an output for or it's an input for the next for the next conversation. I've seen you do both. I've seen you lead exercises where people have had some sort of activity by which they're working together or by themselves and they're drawing things. And then I've also seen you quietly in the back of the room recording what you're hearing in a graphical storyboard almost. Mm -hmm. When you facilitate, do you sometimes do both where you could record what you're hearing at the same time, give people activities to work on in themselves or for themselves? No, that's actually very difficult to do. Those are I would two- think so. <laughs> yeah. I don't, there's no one in my field that does that. You, I, so if I were to be facilitating and I wanted graphic recording, I would hire someone. Somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because it's, yeah. it's just a, it's just a c- kind of polar opposites. Being able to read the room for a facilitation is way different than reading the room for graphic recording. Like I would, I'm listening as a graphic mm. recording. What I'm doing is I'm listening for themes and things that are coming out of the room and the group think and that sort of thing. And then the facilitator or as a facilitator, I am guiding the energy so that most the most can come out of the conversation. So it's sort of like both are necessary, but both are not uh, possible at the same time, not, not by the same person. Totally get it. I mean, it's a bad analogy, but I kind of think about okay. the the leader of a team who has obviously the hierarchy in his or her um, advantage and uh, trying to facilitate a conversation whereby they're trying to create this equal playing field. It's, it's very schizophrenic. You know, it's it's yeah. trying to be the director and the and the actor at the same time. And and I think that's one reason why sometimes. Uh, leaders, you know, hire people like us to allow them to fully participate and not have to be the keeper of the process and be in it themselves. It's it's yeah. hard to do. Yeah. So, all right. So we got this. I mean, I'm even got a couple of your somewhere here, um, where you've got this wonderful storybook. You know, beautiful. And I would think that a person would who was a part of that go, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh right, when Tim said, or when so and so said, or when Rob said. You know, we have all of these sort of visual clues that help us remember what we did and it looks cool and it becomes kind of the uh archetype or um ar- archive of what we did you know and and so it, it but what do you see afterwards when you when a, when a company has these little books that you sometimes create how can that help in onboarding how can that help in recalling the meeting how can that help in storytelling major themes so uh, all of those things happen. Uh, sometimes one of those things happen in one book and uh, a lot in another book. So it kind of depends on what the uh, what the what our ar- artifacts were brought into the book. So, for instance, for Goodwill, we do a year long review of the cultural events. So that is and that really covers the learnings of um of team building and leadership development. It reminds people of the fun that they had. It reminds people of the lessons that they learned over the year. And that particular book can be used for onboarding new people to say like, okay, these are the theories that we're, that we're using or the principles that we're using to bring our culture and our team together. And so there's books that have been written that these workshops have been based on. So there's easy reference to go read up about it. Mm. Uh, and then there's photographs in those books that remember remind people of like what fun they had. And then that, of course, builds culture. That's the culture building aspect of it. And then I've also done books of, which have been just a weekend. So or, you know, a, a few days. Um, I did a three day uh, strategy meeting for an organization up in Colorado And what came out of that was this book that showed the process for creating what the strategy was going to be so that there was a greater understanding of why the strategy was created the way it was created. And then also gave 
cues for how to build out the strategy. So like these were the intentions. This is what we meant. And this is what this is what we we talked about earlier about using visuals as a way to uh, express yourself and help other people understand. So it's not just a sentence. It's literally three pages of drawings and photography of what happened in this creation of this process. Another time I did a, a one day job and they had uh, four big graph or I designed or drew four big graphic recordings. And out of those graphic recordings came future uh, workshops for helping them to determine processes that they were uh, having trouble with. Um, there were little snippets and quotes for that they could use for marketing. There were um, bullet points that they used for helping to align teams. So the, all of this graphic recording work that I do that ends up in some kind of outcome really feeds into the what's next conversation. So what it does is it ties all of the meetings and all of the touch points together into a story that has cohesiveness and connects. So you've asked me, because we've worked together, Dean, can you please give me the agenda for this meeting that you are facilitating, but I'm going to be the graphical recorder of? And so I now understand a little bit now more why you need that, because I watch what you do, and it, and it seems linear in, in your approach. That's not to say that it is. Kind of left to right, this is where we're starting off with a conversation, and there's images that kind of reflect certain themes. And then as we continue on in the day, we keep moving further and further towards the right side of this large piece of paper. Maybe it's eight feet by five feet or whatever. My question is, do you ever sometimes work, work, work backwards versus on a linear perspective to say, I know this is the outcome that they're going for. And maybe you sit back and you listen to this whole conversation and then you build the images that tell a larger story toward the particular outcome versus recording moment by moment what happened. Yes. So I will, I have recorded in kind of a bullet or a, kind of a um, target uh, way. So the center is the, what the outcome needs to be. And then what I'll do is draw from the outside coming in. So then what happens is where the work that you and I do is kind of more linear. So that's where I do it. But if what we're do, if I'm doing something, if I'm drawing for an organization that is, say, brainstorming and funneling or uh, flowing out and then funneling in, I will represent my my drawings like that as well. So the the, the bigger ideas or the greater number of ideas that are out here will eventually be refined and refined and refined until the very center is really what the point is. And right. there are there are templates that have um, by the Grove consultants that use journey map. There's like all kinds of journey mm. mapping. There's mind maps. There's all kinds of ways to create these visual documents. For we talked about that for strategic planning. I know we were sort of waiting on a client to finish their part of the work around a strategic plan that we facilitated a couple of months ago. Yeah. And so you and I have had that discussion. This is great. So I want you to talk about the individual flow state of being able to draw something that they have been instructed to do. Um, I, there's one activity I did and I've done many times before I knew you and I'd like to get your uh, opinion about this. So many, many years ago, we worked with Eddie Bauer. We were up in Seattle. And I think I met the, the CHRO at the time, and she had this really interesting exercise that was kind of akin to helping a person or team identify what their vision was for the organization. And so she had a, an, an exercise that gave you a way to tap into that flow state and to create an image that reflected what you thought the future state should look like, the vision. And it goes like this. It goes, um, I'd like for you to draw a vehicle, and you don't have to define what the vehicle is, right? doesn't mean a car. Something that moves. You want you to define a vehicle, and in this particular picture uh, with this vehicle, where is it going? Where is it coming from? Who is along for the ride? 
who is not along for the ride, how is it being powered and how is it navigating through and around obstacles? And you just give them that. And then, you know, individuals will start to pull out their pens and start drawing different things. And then they would share their picture and we would almost pretend that we were like in a museum and we would have a docent who was going to explain what this picture meant. We sometimes have done it. And in fact, we even did it with one of the clients that you and I work with, where a group of people work together on creating this. So my question in is, is there any suggestions or tips about how to create these sort of images when you're now having to collaborate with other people? So what is really awesome about that exercise that she brought people through is that she chose something that uh, the, uh, a subject that everybody can relate to a vehicle. Mm. And so you don't have to think about she didn't say think of a car, think of a bike. It's like maybe just like what's something that moves in a vehicle. So because we have all had experience with a vehicle, we can without really thinking, giving much thought to it. We can like pick a vehicle and then like, where is it going to? Where is it coming from? So all these questions are really general that virtually everyone can relate to in some way. So that's where this I, like intuition comes from. So intuition is, as Daniel Kahneman says, is just simply recognition. So your intuition comes from recognizing something and then making a decision mm -hmm. based around that recognition. And so when you are in intuition and you are in the flow state, you are in a space where you are using your conscious and unconscious recognition. So I don't know. And I'm not sure if I'm really truly answering your question. No, be, I'd love the fact that you pivoted towards intuition because I'm fascinated by what you're, but I hear you say is that this process helps you tap into your intuition. Yes. If you trust that. And I do, uh, yes. I do believe that. And there's a certain sort of ease that happens when you're doing this. So I guess so what I, my question is, are there any tips around working in this process with other people versus by yourself? If the activity isn't Dean, Sarah, go draw a picture of this particular vehicle. Now we have to get a group to do it. Are there certain inherent barriers that we should be aware of? Are there certain ways that we could set up that activity to best create the group flow that would produce this outcome that of course has its value back in decision making and and collaboration during our nine to five job well i don't know i don't know so it's like it's funny because i'm like it, it seems pretty simple to answer but then it's like i know right um so the as far as like doing it with the group, so you're saying like an unfacilitated group or are you yeah. talking about like a team? On a table of four people, you now have to create this picture. And now you've got that dynamic stuff. Well, this person is really good at drawing and this person, you know, and how do you create that dynamic where everybody participates? We don't just hand it off to the person who somehow feels more confident in drawing where we have that flow energy where everybody has a, a say and can kind of collectively create the image versus one person yeah. getting, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what I do sometimes, especially because I am, I am aware how, of how sensitive people are to this idea of drawing. There's a lot of block, a lot of blocks with some people, yeah. which is that I will often pivot then, especially when it's a group to building. So everybody can build and I, that's such an innate thing for humans is to build and especially if you give people like like legos or um even just like little rolls and paper and tape and stuff it, it, the the expectation is that it's a prototype it's not supposed mm -hmm. to be cool and it cannot even look like anything you can crumple up a piece of paper and call it a car so it's how, whatever you define those uh build th those built things to be so when i am when there are people who have varying levels of like self-imposed talent and uh or, or um barriers to what they think their creativity is if you get people in 
a state of like building things, all of that falls away. So yeah. like three dimensional building and prototyping, yeah. I have never seen anyone not participate in a in a in a building in, uh, environment. Never. So yeah, I guess what you're saying is you're but you're 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 not married only to drawing. Mm-hmm. You're also you, you know really you're not the you're not so centric on a tool. You're you're more centric on the outcome. And I would agree with you. There are so many great building activities out there. And anybody who's listening in, reach out because we've got uh, a few in ours. Certainly you do as well. But I remember one we've done, which is a great TED talk about the marshmallow game or the marshmallow structure, which is fascinating that uses a spaghetti. And uh, there's another one that we did many, many times where you've got a group of people who are trying to, to uh, create a structure to be able to hold a one pound block. And uh, there's certain con- confinements to it and you have to pay for things. And it really is about building a structure and everybody, no matter what social agility style you are, no matter whether you're this disc profile or you're this color or whether you're this Myers-Briggs, everybody gets involved with that. And it's, yeah. it's fascinating, the debrief and all of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just, it's really cool stuff. All right. So Sarah, there's another one of these activities that I want to ask you about. And a lot of companies are at some point or teams at one point or another need to develop alignment, need to be able to create identity and culture around what you might call a set of value. You know, we've been hearing values clarification for as long as, you know, we've been born. You have a unique process for doing that that uses drawing as uh, part of the backbone of that process. Could you walk us through that? What does that look like? Yes. Yeah, so it's called visualize your values. And I think it's very important in visualizing your values to um, actually take the time to draw out what your values are, because then that makes it um, a more concrete image for yourself and then to be able to communicate with others. And then that also can be aligned with with an organization. So how it works is like many values exercises where you take a big, huge list and you start to narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down. And when we get to about five values, then that's when I start to ask people to draw their values. So this is where they're visualizing their values. So I run through a, a short visualization about what the what where the values, where your values come from and how the, you internalize them. And then once they're internalized, how to understand them in a way that you can bring them out and then share them with others. So once we get down to a short list of values, then I start, we start drawing out what those values are. And so, for example, so one of my values is um, beauty and beauty can mean anything to any 8 billion people can mean something different. My particular value in beauty is around being in beautiful environments. So like the picture behind you is like that would be an example of what I find to be beautiful, being out in nature and um, experiencing nature and beautiful sunsets and rolling hills and beautiful rivers. So as a result of me being able to know that for myself through my own drawing, I can express that to others. And as you know, when you know what each other's values are, especially when you're in a management position, you can really manage people in a more effective way. Yes. And so then you would create pictures. Each individual would create a picture of their values. And then how do you roll that up to a common set of values for a team or for an organization? You've all got five key values. You've all got five pictures. We've got five people on this team. Now we've got 25 values, which might be too many to manage, or you've got a hundred people, you know, which becomes 500 values. How do you bring it all together? <laughs> yeah. So the first of all, the organization has to know what their what the values are. So for, you know, the, for the organization, what are the organizational values? So if the organization okay. doesn't know what their values are, it's going to be very hard for a hundred people to align their values. So the first right. thing to do is to make sure that the organization has values and they also define them very specifically about what that is. So when we work through this workshop, everyone determines what their their personal values are. And then there is this filter that we bring the personal values through to get them aligned with with some of the with what the organizational values are. 
So for instance, like my value is beauty and I love beautiful surroundings and my organization's value might be like teamwork, for okay. instance. Okay. So through this, this uh, filter that I create, I can connect, the, the organization can connect their, I, I, their value of, of teamwork to my value of beauty in, in that, like, for instance, organization. Like, I can understand that beauty for me is organization. And so the organization of teamwork is going to align my uh, value of beauty with the organization. Does that make okay. sense? Okay. Yeah, so you're kind of creating some sinew or some connective tissue between yes. the individual yes. and versus... So this is where I, 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 I sometimes wonder about you know and i get what you're what you just said that there's a top down bottom up or or both coming together you what you kind of said is let's both come together we have the organizational values we have the individual values and they they, they they sometimes they meet in the middle do you ever sometimes use this process to be able to create the organizational values from the bottom up with the individuals presenting out what they believe and then you take the aggregate of all this and go okay so based on our strategy based on our vision and we have all this wonderful data that's showing up as pictures then which of these all combined help us get us to where we're going as a culture? Because the culture we have today isn't necessarily the culture that we're going to need tomorrow. So we got to be cognizant of that. Is there some sort of magic that takes place in your world that helps bring that together to create those values for the organization? Well, an organization, as you know, is a, is a live body that's changing all the time. And so the values that exist for a group that, ha that may come together like this, like say there's an organization that's 25 people, we go through uh, the organization trying to figure out what their their values are. We use the group, the team to create those values. And then the team doubles in a year or triples in a year and sometimes even more. Well, that is absolutely going to change the culture and the values. So there needs to be, so the answer is yes, you can do that. And there needs to be a regular reassessment of the values that have been established and if they still matter. And, yeah. you know, a lot, a lot of that comes through, you know, the hiring process is very difficult. And to hire people to come in with the values that you have already and build is, is really difficult. And then you lose people. And so oh, for sure. Yeah. So it's, there's, it's, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think what we're kind of saying here in some ways is that it's important to know what the individual values are so then we can put them in the right role. Yes. We can um, provide them the opportunity to express those values. Yes. We can even maybe even if I know that yours is beauty, oh, you know, Sarah's going to is going to thrive in a, in a beautiful environment or, you know, what have you. So those things I think are useful on that level. When we start getting on the organizational level, it does become a little bit more interesting and in that I think that the the role of creating values should be informed by the individual employees but not dictated by and what i mean by that is just because i love good food doesn't mean that i'm a great cook and so at some point we need to take all this information and go okay now what are we going to make from this based on what we're trying to create so there's this this sort of in between let's play a part. Let's, let's include the ideas and passions of our people. Let's also take a look at where we're heading as an organization and where do we need to be as an organization. And when you bring all this together, what kind of values and culture are we trying to create? And then, of course, that becomes, you know, a, a whole nother area around succession planning and accountability and performance management and onboarding and, you know, hiring the right people. And again, you, to your point, it's an obviously evolutionary process that can constantly change. Well, and, and the layers and, you know, especially with a large organization, the layers really matter. So the 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 higher layers of like vice, like the C-suite, vice president, directors, those people are really supporting and realizing the values of the organization. And they are hiring people that fit in with that. So yes. you may have you may have, you know, manager level people who can influence it, like you say, but really who is directing 
the values and the culture of the organization becomes more important the higher you go through into the organization. Yeah, now we're getting into, uh, I love we're getting into the stratosphere. We're going from the individual out to like, you know, Pluto here. <laughs> but I, uh, but I, I think that sometimes we as leaders choose values for the organization because we value that. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's best for the organization, you know, and then you get into diversity and inclusion and all the other things that sort of wrap around that. As you go back to what you said before, which was absolutely right, is that the organization is a living entity, almost like a living human being. So we have to ask ourselves, what does the indiv- what does the company need? The living entity called the company need, not so much what I need. I'm a part of it, but I got to almost divorce myself from thinking it's all about what I think to what does the organization think. And if I can separate that, then the values that we create are for that. My role is to help guide that, include my my viewpoints into that. But not just reproduce what I am and you are and just have clones of all of us, which is not going to help us at all. Yeah. Yeah. All right, gee, Sarah, can we just keep talking for another two hours? Gee whiz. (laughs) Are we at time already? Well, I I think we are. But, you know, um, as you know, you're going to be able to visit us up here in in beautiful Bend, Oregon. So we'll continue this over maybe a, a glass of wine or around a fireplace. But. Yeah, we probably should, unfortunately. But tell uh, our listeners where they can follow you, connect to you, what's going on with you in the future, all that kind of good stuff. Oh, well, I am. Uh, I have got big plans. Um, well, you could, <laughs> as always. Yes, you um, do. I am working on um, I'm working around this idea of um, pivoting and reinvention. So. I, you will soon start to see things from me around that. Um, I'm looking into maybe doing a podcast about that. So Good. the other place that you can find me is 26-letters.com. That's my website. And um, you can find me on Instagram, 26lettersaz. I'm also on um, LinkedIn. Uh, but uh, yeah, or you know, just, just reach out to me through my website and uh, keep an eye out on all the social media for the things that are coming up soon. Yeah. And again, big shout out to you. I just think your work is uh, very valuable and unique and you do it very, very well. And I'm just uh, pleased to know you as a colleague and as a friend. And I, I'm so glad that you were able to spend a few minutes here on this this little show of ours. Thank you, Dean. I really appreciate it. It's been so fun to know you and be on the show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate and review on Apple Podcasts, Google Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.